This is a pre-recorded webinar featuring moderator Steve Pine with presenters Dan Riley, Jason Church, and Melody Gayeski. All materials used by our presenters will be available for download. Steve Pine is Senior Conservator of Decorative Arts at the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston. He has assisted in recovery assessments and cleanup of public and private collections after Katrina and Rita in 2005 and collaborated on recovery workshops in Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas. Steve was deployed as part of the National Heritage Responders to assist cultural institutions on Galveston Island following Hurricane Ike and in New York City following Superstorm Sandy. He is a member and president emeritus of the Texas Collections Emergency Resource Alliance, Texas CIRA. As we approach the heart of the hurricane season on the Gulf Coast, it seems appropriate we remind ourselves of the resources and experience we have available to help us prepare for storms. Armed with the most accurate and useful information, recognition of the public support organizations at hand to help and time to review our vulnerabilities, we can place ourselves in a position to minimize risks and improve outcomes should another hurricane hit our area. We have uh, some distinguished and accomplished uh, group of uh, speakers this morning. Uh, I don't want to uh, 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 delay too much, so I'd like to uh, introduce our first presenter, Dan Riley of uh, NOAA. Dan is the Warning Coordination Meteorologist at the Weather National Weather Center for the Houston-Galveston area, which is a part of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, providing timely and accurate information projections we all rely on to make good decisions regarding storm potential and its impact on the region. Now I'll turn, turn the uh, webinar over to Dan. Good morning. I'd like to talk to you today about hurricane hazards and also how to prepare for the 2020 hurricane season. First thing I want you to know is every storm is different typically contains some combination of the hazards you see here damaging winds storm surge flooding flooding from heavy rains and tornadoes and as we know uh, those of us who live in hurricane country every storm really is different hurricane ike was so much different than hurricane harvey uh, which was different as well from something like tropical storm allison and so we'll talk about these different hazards in the presentation today. Another fifth hazard you might add too is the high surf and rip currents for those folks at the beach. Those can be also be very important. So of those five hazards, which are the most dangerous? Which are the most deadly? And that's what the pie chart on the left hand side is showing us the percentage of fatalities caused by each of a number of hazards. And you can see storm surge flooding accounts for about half of the fatalities and flooding from heavy rain a little over a quarter. So it really is the water related hazards that are the most deadly. Notice wind 8%, tornado 3%, still very dangerous, but it really is the water related hazards. And you might include surf in that as well. Uh, that are the most deadly. Now the bar chart on the right hand side is also interesting. It tells us what percentage of storms have a fatality from that given hazard and what you can see there is fatalities from rainfall flooding uh, are found in about half of the storms and due, due to storm surge about 10% but when we do get the storm surge events, it can be very, very many fatalities. The Galveston 1900 hurricane is a great example of that. Uh, six to 8,000 people died uh, in that storm due to storm surge, our, our nation's greatest natural disaster uh, to this day. Let's look at uh, the different parts of the hurricane now. What we have here is a radar image of Hurricane Ike. And most of us are probably familiar looking at weather radar with the different colors indicate different rainfall intensities. So the red indicates heavy rain, the yellow moderate, and the green, the green light rain. That area in the middle of the hurricane there with blue, that's the eye of the hurricane. And in the eye, the winds go nearly calm. 
right in the middle of the storm. And the eye actually passed over the weather office, so I can confirm, uh, sure enough, very calm conditions in the eye. But in the ring surrounding the eye, that's called the eye wall. That's where the highest winds are in the hurricane. So if the eye wall passes over your, your location, you're going to get those highest winds in the storm. Also, I've outlined some of the bands uh, kind of spiraling out from the center. These are called spiral bands. You can get gusty winds, very heavy rain, and tornadoes in those spiral bands especially on the right-hand side of the storm. The hurricane wind hazard, um, as I mentioned, uh, storm surge flooding and flooding from heavy rains are the most deadly, but hurricane winds also extremely dangerous. These are some photos from Hurricane Michael, which hit the uh, Florida Panhandle a few years ago, uh, made landfall as a Category 5 hurricane. And what do I mean by Category 5 hurricane? That's the uh, that's 5 on the Saffir-Simpson hurricane wind scale. Goes from 1 to 5, where 5 is the most significant, and 1 is the lowest end of that scale. But notice the winds that are assigned to each category. Category 1, sustained winds of 74 to 95 miles per hour. Very, very strong damaging winds, even at the Category 1 level. Uh, so don't let your guard down if it's a Category 1 or Category 2. If that eye wall comes over you, you're going to get those very, very high winds. Hurricane Ike, actually a Category 2 at landfall, 110 mile per hour sustained winds. But the other thing I want to point out here is it is a wind scale. It is not at all hazards severity scale. Some, one thing we saw with Hurricane Ike is people were saying, oh, it's just a two, you know, maybe I won't evacuate. But fact is, the storm surge from this very large Category 2 hurricane was more like a Category 4, you know, very, very life-threatening and very dangerous. So don't rely too much on this one number. Hurricane Harvey uh, was actually a Category 4 at landfall where it made landfall down the coast down in the uh, Rockport area in that area we saw wind gusts of 150 miles per hour in that one area and if we do get a, had a, a high category storm like this you can expect the wind hazard to be very uh, devastating very dangerous and you can see some of the damage there from this category 4 landfall the water hazards, as I've said, uh, rainfall and storm surge flooding, uh, these are the most dangerous, the most deadly. And we have a recent example, of course, uh, Hurricane Harvey. You can see it spinning around, making landfall uh, down there near uh, Rockport, Texas. And for folks on the mid-Texas coast and the coastal bend, Harvey was all about very high winds and storm surge. But for us in the Houston-Galveston area, we were getting those spiral bands, and you can see the bands on the radar loop there feeding into our area, uh, producing very, very heavy rain uh, over a several day period. And of course, uh, that led to uh, really catastrophic flooding from that uh, and record amounts of rainfall. Notice Harvey's track shown on the map on the right hand side. And what you see is the storm coming steadily in and then sort of stalling and then just sort of slowly looping back uh, over the area and passing just uh, south of Galveston before making a second landfall in Louisiana. Anytime you have a hurricane or a tropical storm moving slowly, right away you need to be thinking that someplace is going to get some very, very high rainfall amounts and perhaps some flooding. And absolutely that's what happened here with Harvey. As I mentioned, these were record rainfall amounts uh, that occurred with Harvey, the most uh, ever from a tropical system, uh, an Atlantic tropical system, over 60 inches of rain near Nederland, Texas. And then on this map, you can see some dark blue areas, greater than 50 inches of rain over multiple counties. 
So it's not just the extremely high rainfall amounts, but it's a very large coverage from Harvey uh, that occurred. Just a tremendous amount of rainfall. Never had a storm uh, produce this amount of rain over such a large area. And no surprise, it led to catastrophic flooding and unfortunately many fatalities. So uh, Harvey was unusual, but wouldn't you know, just a few years later, in 2019, we had Tropical Storm Imelda, uh, which also produced just a tremendous amount of rainfall. And just like Harvey, it was really the spiral bands from the storm that were responsible for all the heavy rain. Uh, you can see uh, in this case, the band was kind of on the back side of that swirl. And the, the area impacted was much smaller than with Harvey. Uh, but we did have some amounts of greater than 40 inches of rain, most of that falling within about a 12 to 18 hour period. So uh, in this case, it missed the Houston metro area just barely. Uh, it fell over a more rural area, uh, but nonetheless, uh, that amount of rain over such a short period of time uh, led to more catastrophic flooding. Let's talk a little bit now about Hurricane Ike, which occurred in 2008. And you can see the radar from Hurricane Ike. This was a much bigger uh, hurricane than, say, an Imelda. And also notice it moved fairly quickly out of the area. So in this case, the, the, the rainfall was not the dominant hazard. But with a large hurricane like this, it pushes a lot of water up onto land. So storm surge flooding in fact, was the biggest impact from Hurricane Ike. Also, there were uh, power outages for uh, millions of customers because we had a very large wind field with Hurricane Ike, a very large footprint. And as we said, every storm is different. Ike, the, the, the most dominant hazard here was storm surge. And here are some photographs uh, from Galveston uh, and the west end of Galveston Island. You can see, uh, I want you to look at the photograph in the lower left. You can see the water levels had risen uh, significantly by Friday morning with this, the winds of the storm yet to arrive. And so if you look at that photo, there's some people being rescued there who had intended to leave Friday morning thinking the storm wasn't going to arrive until late that night. But by then it was too late. Uh, the water had risen. They couldn't get out by their vehicles. So they had to be rescued by boat or by helicopter. And Coast Guard actually rescued hundreds of folks uh, during the day ahead of the, the storm coming in. No doubt saved a lot of lives. Notice also the surf uh, there hitting the seawall, uh, all that spray uh, getting uh, pushed up. Uh, you know, the waves and the surf are, are another very hazardous feature of these uh, hurricanes. And then uh, here's the aftermath of Hurricane Ike. This is Bolivar Peninsula, the barrier island just up the coast from Galveston. You can see the power of water uh, surging in and then pulling right back out. Pretty much swept that area clean. So you can see why uh, we really have to get people out of the storm surge zones. Um, this is really not survivable um, if, if you're stuck on this barrier island with a storm like Hurricane Ike. So one question uh, about all these hazards you uh, need to consider is what is your risk either at your home or business? Uh, are you at risk for storm surge flooding? You know, what about winds? You know, what, what, uh, what uh, level is your structure built to? You know, what, to what winds can it, uh, can it stand strong? But first talking about storm surge, it's really all about the elevation of the ground uh, where you're at. Uh, if, you're, if your ground elevation is at a lower level than the water is forecast to get to uh, from the high tide and the storm surge, then you're liable to be flooded, uh, especially if there's no levee or anything else between you and the water. And so what we have on the map on the right-hand side is ground elevation data uh, taken by LIDAR. And you can see all those areas in green are less than 10 feet above sea level, and those were much the same areas that were flooded from Hurricane Ike's storm surge, which was up around 10 to 13 feet 
along the bay. And look at uh, Chambers County. Uh, you can see flooding almost all the way up to I-10 there. So uh, some of our counties are, are, are quite low elevation-wise and are vulnerable to storm surge flooding. Incidentally, the evacuation charts in the lower left for the Houston-Galveston area, you can see how similar they are to the ground elevation map. Uh, and that's because they're, they're based primarily on that surge hazard risk. There is a website shown at the bottom of the page here where you can get kind of a, a, a general look at what your risk is at your location. I've zoomed in here in the Houston-Galveston area, but you can look at any part of the coast across the nation uh, using this website. So uh, this is kind of a worst case flooding uh, above ground level for a category one, category two, three. Now notice the reds here are greater than nine feet above ground level, a worst case category four and a worst case category five. So if your location, either home or business is in one of these shaded areas, you do have a storm surge risk. Uh, the flip side is if it's not, uh, storm surge is not a major concern for you. Uh, what about those hatched areas there? Those are levied areas. And so uh, it's really uh, hard to, to portray the risk uh, for the levied areas on a map like this. But just understand that levees are really meant to protect property. Um, you know, I wouldn't trust my life or the life of my family to a levy. Uh, levy fails, uh, then you're you're really in trouble. So keep that in mind. And then the last hazard I want to mention: uh, tornadoes and water spouts. Uh, these quite often occur in the spiral bands on the right-hand side of the track. If you look at the radar image on the lower left, there you can see Hurricane Harvey, the center of it spinning there, uh, just uh, southeast of Gonzales. Uh, and uh, but the bands are over the Houston Galveston area with thunderstorms along those spiral bands and many of those were spinning and producing tornadoes so but we estimate 22 tornadoes with uh, Harvey uh, again mostly in those spiral bands so those are the hurricane hazards uh, how do we stay informed how do, how do we be best prepared during the hurricane season uh, one part of that is to uh, keep track of what's going on in the tropics. You can see some websites there, hurricanes.gov, uh, weather.gov is the uh, National Weather Service, uh, weather.gov slash Houston uh, will get you to the Houston-Galveston area. And then it's good to look at emergency management uh, pages uh, for your jurisdiction to uh, stay informed. Hurricanes.gov, by the way, that's the National Hurricane Center website. And so let's take a look at the, uh, this uh, tropical weather outlook, the two-day outlook. Uh, this is from Monday, August 17th, uh, when we're uh, doing this recording. And what do you see here? Well, you've got two yellow Xs and a percentage uh, listed. These are two disturbances over the tropical Atlantic that have a 20% chance of becoming a tropical depression or tropical storm over the next two days, uh, and hence the name uh, two-day tropical weather outlook. So it tells you what uh, disturbances the Hurricane Center is monitoring and uh, what is the possibility they could develop into something more serious, uh, tropical depression or storm, and then perhaps even a hurricane after that. There is a five-day version as well. I think this is probably the most useful thing to look at probably every day uh, during the hurricane season. And what this is saying is there's a disturbance at the position of the orange X as of Monday morning. And it has a medium chance of developing in the hatched area in the next five days. So we've got two disturbances again that we're watching. And there is a, a medium chance they could become tropical depressions or storms over the next five days as they track toward the west in those orange hatched areas. So uh, as of Monday, we, you know, we have a couple of storms where, where disturbances we're watching. Uh, by the time of this workshop, it's possible one or both of them uh, could be tropical storms or even hurricanes.
and you can see uh, there's potential they could ultimately head into the Gulf. So uh, we are indeed in the peak of the hurricane season. It's good to be aware of what's going on out there. And you access this at hurricanes.gov. How do we get ready? Uh, really all of us, our families, our businesses, um, good to have a, uh, a kit uh, of supplies in case we get a hurricane, whether we we stay in place or we evacuate, it's good to have a kit um, that you can draw from. It's good to have your important documents in order and confirm your coverage with your insurance agency. One thing you really want to do uh, is make sure you have flood insurance, which is not covered by your standard homeowner's insurance. And for, for those that may, are maintaining collections, uh, you know, the insurance could also be a, a very important element. And then determine if you live in a hurricane evacuation zone. Uh, if so, you know, what are your plans? Where will you go? Where will you evacuate? Determine your risk. This is a very important uh, aspect of both home and uh, business and for those that are maintaining collections. Uh, what is the risk for these different hazards uh, for your location? If you are in an evacuation zone, uh, you're going to want to have that evacuation plan. First, find out if you're in an evacuation zone. Plan your route out. Uh, follow evacuation orders. Plan for your pets, which is normally take your pets with you uh, when you evacuate. And TxDOT uh, does maintain a uh, maps of evacuation routes. Uh, these are suggested routes you can take that the state will support as far as uh, gasoline and, and supplies and things like that. So these are the routes in blue that they would like you to take. Um, on this website, you can find maps for the whole state of Texas. Uh, what about those blue, white dashed lines? Um, as a last resort, uh, the state can deter can enact contraflow for those areas, meaning routing all traffic outbound. And that's kind of a last resort, uh, kind of uh, if we have a Rita type evacuation where the roads are jammed and, um, you know, we need to turn everyone outbound on those routes. Mentioned disaster supplies, what goes in your kit? Certainly food and water, non-perishable food items. Uh, medicines, batteries, radios, chargers. Uh, make sure it's good to keep your gas tank more than half full during the hurricane season. As we know, you know, if we lose power, it can be hard to uh, to find gas and then have extra cash on hand. Uh, this is just a more uh, uh, lengthy list of the types of things uh, that you can put uh, in your emergency supply list. Of course, with the, the coronavirus this year, uh, you know, it's good to have masks with you, uh, sanitizer, and, um, you know, always keeping uh, social distancing in mind as well. And then it's good to uh, check your, with your agent on your insurance. Uh, do you have adequate insurance? Do you have flood insurance? Um, flood insurance is subsidized uh, by the federal government the National Flood Insurance Program. And even if you're not in a flood zone, uh, given the amounts of rain we can get here in Texas, uh, for most of us, flood insurance is really going to be a bargain, uh, you know, given the, that you can be made whole uh, mostly after a, an event like Harvey. If you don't have flood insurance, it's much harder to recover. And so uh, I know we have a lot of folks uh, uh, maintaining collections, uh, artifacts, museums, and we, we have a couple examples where uh, hurricanes came into play, uh, maybe damaging collections. I actually was working in Southeast Virginia in 2005, and uh, we had Hurricane Isabel, and um, Isabel uh, created tremendous storm surge and actually damaged a lot of the uh, archaeological collection uh, at Jamestown. Uh, so there, there was a case where um, a lot of uh, artifacts were stored in a surge zone uh, at a fairly low elevation. And if, if the folks knew the risk 
um, they, it would have been a simple matter to, to move those items or at least store at a higher, higher uh, locations, more secure uh, areas um, outside of the search zone. So there was one case where uh, this kind of came into play. And uh, the Caribbean, uh, another uh, news story here uh, about uh, museums in the Caribbean and uh, the, the, uh, the actions taken uh, by museums um, to, to, uh, for, to keep those treasures safe uh, in those museums. So uh, there was a situation where um, actions were taken and protected some of those really valuable uh, mm -hmm. treasures. So the general takeaways for folks maintaining collections, understand the risks, the vulnerabilities to wind, surge, and rainfall flooding where the collections are stored, uh, try mitigation measures to limit the risk, store in a more sturdy structure, uh, higher elevation, outside surge and flood zones, etc. And you can also look at uh, surge, uh, excuse me, rainfall risk maps as well, flooding rainfall risk maps that FEMA maintains to help assess that part of the hazard risk. Just finishing up now, uh, what is the forecast for this hurricane season? NOAA is forecasting the possibility of an extremely active season. Uh, you can see 19 to 25 named storms. Uh, the average is 12. So, uh, and then on the left-hand column, you can see the named storms we've already had. And you know, we're only in early August, so we're well in our way. To, to getting up into that 19 to 25 name storm uh, range. Interestingly, if we go over into 21, uh, we run out of names. And if, if that's the case, the Greek alphabet is used. And this only happened one other time back in 2005 where we had so many storms, we had to use uh, Greek letters like alpha, beta, and so on. Final slide here. Uh, it's important to follow trusted sources, you know, nowadays on the web, on social media, every, you know, there's a lot of so-called experts out there uh, putting a lot of information about everything, uh, including weather. And I would really encourage you to follow us at the National Weather Service. Uh, you can see our website, our Twitter and Facebook feeds there. Also, the National Hurricane Center uh, has a great website and social media feeds just to get kind of the trusted information. The local stations also are, are very good as well. Um, so, but, but just be wary uh, of, of a lot of information out there that might not be accurate. Well, thank you, Dan. Thank you. Do you want to add anything uh, before we move on to uh, Jason? Uh, just quickly, we actually have two tropical depressions out there now, uh, including one that was just uh, d defined as a depression in the Caribbean. So, you know, areas along the Texas, Louisiana, Gulf Coast in general need to be uh, wary of that. Uh, it looks like it'll come up uh, our way uh, along about Tuesday or Wednesday of next week. So we have a storm, a real threat. Uh, there's another one that's uh, headed more toward uh, Florida. Uh, so. Keep uh, keep that website in mind, hurricanes.gov. And okay, thanks so much, Dan. I'm so glad that we've made connection uh, uh, and uh, love having you as a resource. Uh, knowing that you're out there is is a great uh, source of uh, uh, comfort and and improves our our sense of security uh, as we uh, try to deal with all of this.